Good morning. Good to see you. I was impressed uh, uh, this morning a little bit on one of the TV shows, and I want to read Psalms 33, verse 12 and verse 18. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy. So as a country, United States of America, we need to pay attention to that, don't we? Uh, we need to listen to that. All right. A uh, <clears throat> few announcements. Sunday school attendance, 30, offering of $17,280. Praise the Lord for that. All right. Uh, you can see during the month of July, we're collecting for the Lance Duval Scholarship Offering. Uh, right uh, Tonight, we need a little short business meeting to decide a couple of things on our revival right after the preaching service. And don't forget the fifth Sunday singing this month. And uh, also on that, uh, we're planning on sort of throwing Mr. Willie Ezel a little birthday party right after the fifth Sunday singing if we can get it all worked out uh, concerning him. Uh, WMU meets tomorrow night at 7 p.m. And don't forget our revival is August the 7th through the 10th. Uh, our theme for this year is pray, participate, promote. So do that. Uh, and you can see even sometime by our attendance that we need to pray uh, for, our, for our revival and for America. Pray for our nominating committee. Uh, on that. All right. Let's see. I had a good bit down. Is that is that all of it? Any more announcements? Something I might be missing, people? Uh, for yes. Mm -hmm. Got a little special bit meet right after the preaching service tonight. Okay. Concerning the revival. Okay. Anniversaries. Uh, there's a card out there for Pam and Liss. If you would sign that. Uh, also a birthday card for Ben Shaw, if you would sign that. And then we have one, Brady Avan. Is he here today? Upstairs. Hold your hand up, I can't see you. <laughs> All right. Let's sing happy birthday to Brady Avan. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. birthday to you and many many more all right anything else before I uh, read the prayer list okay I think I got it all at the bottom okay uh, uh, Beth and Terry Tingle uh, Don Wiltshire Vince Ewing Jimmy and Carol Sanders Jennifer Motsinger Jim and Barbara, Greg and Irene, Willie Ezel, John and Norma, Gary and Beth Moore, The Revival, uh, that start August the 7th, Gary and Phyllis Minga, The Jody G Family, Kent and Donna Winger, Danny Henson, James Cervantes, and Jessica, The Loss of Their Newborn, Kenny Mims, and The Ruby Jean Criddle Family. Brother Greg Avant, would you lead us please, sir? start off our song service with Lord I lift your name on high if y'all please stand and join us as we sing <clears throat> Lord I lift your name on high Lord I love to sing your praises I'm so glad you're in my life I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My dead to the from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name Lord, I love to see 
I want to thank you guys for supporting me on my mission trip to Hurricane Baptist Church in Gainstown, Alabama. Gainstown is approximately 35 miles northeast of Waynesboro, Mississippi. Hurricane Baptist Church was established way back in 1816 and is a very mission-centered or oriented church. They support most of the outreach that are done through the Southern Baptist Convention and they put a whole lot of emphasis on Vacation Bible School and Operation Christmas Child. Their weekly attendance ranges from 40 to 50 persons. I asked one of their deacons why they were rebuilding such a large church. They had a small church and they was building a huge church, a big church. And he told me they need room for their Vacation Bible School. Uh, and other services that they do. You know, Vacation Bible School last, or before their church burnt down, was 150 kids. They, 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 had, they talk in big numbers. They, they, it's huge. And I don't know how they, they, they must get the whole west end of Alabama down there for their church because they got, they got just about every kind of kid they got. In November 2020, during a thunderstorm, the church kitchen was hit with lightning and started a fire that could not be contained and destroyed everything. That place, every songbook was burned up, everything was burned. With the exception of one thing. They had in front of their church a stone monument with the Ten Commandments on it. And it's still there, they cleaned it up and they planned to put it in front of their church. It's really cool, it's a really nice looking monument. And you'll see, I'm fixing to show it, a slideshow and you'll see that monument as it showed in their old church. This will be placed in front of the new church. I was blessed by the love of our church for sending me and I was again blessed by the love of all the members of the Hurricane Baptist Church. As they worked, they didn't just sit back and watch us work, they got, they was right along elbow to elbow helping us work at that church as we was doing it. In this hot weather and everything as we was putting up walls and everything, they was there right there with us and making meals and everything. They, it was a really loving church. I, I was really blessed. And let me tell you, I've done a lot of mission trips, but that by far was the best mission trip I've ever been on. If you could just see the, the love that they, I got from here and what I got down there, it was just, it was just a blessing for me. And I, I'll probably be going back as soon as they can find somebody to put the sheetrock up. We'll go down there and finish up the electric. But uh, I got a, about an 11-minute... Uh, video I want you all to see that the Hurricane Baptist Church put out uh, they they made for us it kind of tells you what their church is and some of the work that we did all right
tragic, you know, to have to see how that fire took over that uh, building, but to see God using His people to rebuild. And, and uh, one thing that I saw that inspired me was them meeting out in that field. You know, the, the, uh, the building can be destroyed, uh, but we are the church, amen? Um, this morning, I, I want to invite you again to the book of Revelation. Uh, week before last, you remember a message entitled, Hell is a Real Place. Probably not a very popular sermon topic. And so this morning, uh, I want to bring to you a message that probably is a very popular sermon topic, uh, but it is the fact that heaven is a real place. Amen. And we await uh, the time for us to be there uh, for all eternity with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, as you found your place now in Revelation chapter 21, I, I want to begin here reading and, and remind you that, that Jesus gave uh, a revelation uh, to John. Uh, God revealed to John on the island of Patmos late in his life uh, a glimpse into what heaven is going to be like. And I use that word glimpse because I, I think that's only what we can uh, see here is just a glimpse of what heaven is going to be like. Now, as we begin here reading in verse uh, 1 of chapter 21, I encourage you later to go and read the remainder of chapter 21 because it gives us more of an idea of what heaven is going to be like. But this morning we're going to cover the first eight verses of a message entitled, Heaven is a Real Place. John and said, And now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice, verse 3, from heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. And there shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And verse 6 says, And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Verse 8 says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Let's pray together this morning. Fathers, we read these words of Scripture. We are just in awe of how you chose us, as your word says, before the foundation of the world, that you chose to save us. And Father, one day you will come and take us, as your word says, that where you are there we may be also. And Father, it is good to know that heaven is a real place and that we can anticipate those of us that have placed our faith in you in your son Jesus, in his finished work at the cross, that we will be able to spend eternity forever worshiping you as our Lord and as our Savior. And Father, this morning as we hear your message, Father, I pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts. And Lord, if there's someone here that does not know you as their Savior, that today would be the day of salvation so that they too can rejoice in the truth that heaven is a real. Father, thank you for your son Jesus. And it's in his precious and holy name that I pray. And I ask all these things. Amen. You know, this morning as we look at the message, the title of the message, Heaven is a Real Place. Now, we all want to believe that. But the thing about it is if we look back, the last couple of weeks we saw that hell is a real place. Now, oftentimes we don't want to remember and we don't want to Think about the fact that hell is a real place. 
Now this morning as we open up God's Word and, and, and in the Revelation we see that God is revealing to John that yes, heaven is a real place. And heaven is the promise, church, of those who place their faith not in the church, but in Christ Jesus. See, I want you to understand that heaven is not a place for good people, okay? I want to explain this to you because we often sometimes live in a world that says, well, when, when bad people die, they go to a bad place. And when the good people die, they go to a good place. Friend, that is a lie straight from the devil himself. Heaven is not reserved for good people. Heaven, church, is a place for saved people. Born again by the precious blood of Jesus that we can spend eternity with Him. Now, how do we get to heaven? We live a good life. We go on mission trips. We give to organizations. No, those are results, church. Of our salvation. So how do we get to heaven? Through Jesus Christ. It's only through Jesus. That we have placed our faith in him. And his finished work at Calvary. That we are able to get into heaven. And how long are we going to be in heaven? Forever and ever and ever. This morning as we begin to unpack these verses, I want us to see first of all in verse 3 that we have to understand that heaven is a reserved place. Heaven is a reserved place. Verse 3 says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And I really like this part here. It says, God himself will be with them and be their God. You know, I've been asked this question many times. Where is heaven? Where is heaven? And I am convinced by the words of Scripture that heaven, church, is in the presence of Almighty God. Heaven is a reserved place. But here's the thing about our reservations. They are in Jesus' name. One time we were going on a trip. And we had, we had planned out our route to stay at certain places at certain times on our trip. It was kind of one of those journeys, if you will. Uh, we would go a certain place and stay. And we'd go the next day a certain journey. And then we would stay another place. And we would go a certain journey the next day to stay a certain place. And finally we were exhausted and out of money and we had to come home. But on that journey, we had reservations here, 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 and here. And you know how you can only check in at a certain time and you've got to be checked out by a certain time. And so as we're on our journey, check-in wasn't until 3 o'clock that afternoon, but we didn't get there till about 10 o'clock that night. And we had, look at me, we had reservations. And when we got there, they just assumed that we weren't coming. So what do you think they did? They gave our room to somebody else. We had reservations. We had a, we had a, a hold on our card that said, hey, when we get here, we're going to pay you for our room. And they said, oh, well, we didn't think you were coming and we were almost full. And so we gave your room to someone else. We finally stumbled around and found another place to stay, another place to lie down, at least a place to get flat and, and to get a rest, a little bit of rest, and then we got a shower the next morning. Well, off we were again until we were exhausted and out of money again. Thing, church, about our reservations in heaven. They're not in our name. We're not going to get there and find out, oh, someone else took your room, someone else took this, and someone else did this. Because listen to this, our reservation in heaven is placed and written in the blood of Jesus, in Jesus' name. The question has been asked, where is heaven? Jesus said in John chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. 
And in verse 2 he said, In my Father's house are many mansions or rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go, listen to this, I go to prepare a place for you. And here's why. He said, If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. I will come again and receive you to myself. And here's, here, here's the presence of God. So that where I am, there you may be also. Where is heaven, church? It's in the presence of Almighty God. We talked about hell. And again, hell is not a very popular topic. Hell is kind of one of those topics that, that maybe we just sort of say, well, if I, if I ignore it, it'll go away. Hell's not like a bully in school. It's a real place. The only thing we can do about it is recognize it and make reservations with Jesus for our eternal destination. But, you know, we talked about hell, and, and what's, the, what's the worst thing going to be about hell? Let, let me kind of... Uh, I uh, remind you about some things. You know, uh, there's going to be some things that we've, that we've read in Scripture that are going to take place in hell. And, and there's going to be a fire that's never quenched, the worm that never dies, the, the, the weeping and gnashing of teeth, the fire and the brimstone, and, and on and on and on we know. And, and so, we, so th those things are horrible. But what's the worst thing about hell is being separated from Almighty God for all eternity. Now, we've got to go look at the other side of this because we ask the question of what is the best thing about heaven? And you might immediately say, well, I'm going to be reunited with loved ones that have gone on before me. I'm going to see my match. And I'm going to see the place that God has reserved for me. He prepared this place for me. And I'm going to be able to see that with my own eyes. I'm going to be able to meet the saints of the Testaments. And I'm going to have so many questions that I'm going to be able to ask and they are going to be answered. Those things are wonderful. But listen to me when I say this. The greatest thing about heaven is meeting Jesus face to face. Meeting Jesus face to face. Many talk of heaven and the scripture says there will be no more tears, no more crying, no more sadness, no more sickness, no more separation, no more death, no more humanity, no more... It doesn't say that. I added that part. <laughs> There's a lot of things that are going to be in heaven. But Jesus is going to be there. And we're going to see him face to face. Pray that you recognize that heaven is a reserved place. But see, here's the thing about heaven, church. Wanting to go to heaven is not enough to get you there, okay? Understand this, because everyone wants to go to heaven. If I were to ask you this morning, who wants to go to heaven? Everybody's hand would go up. Now you might say, well, don't get up a load yet, preacher. There was a man that told about his, told about his wife who taught seven-year-old Sunday school. In one of her classes, she asked those seven-year-old students, who wants to go to heaven? And everybody's hand went up but this one little girl. So the gentleman's wife asked her during the class, why don't you want to go to heaven, sweet angel? The little girl re required, because my mom told me to come straight home after Sunday school. <laughs> we all want to go to heaven. But wanting to go to heaven is not enough to get us there. Now let's look at the other side of this. Nobody wants to go to hell. But do you understand that not wanting to go to hell is enough either? So the question is asked, well, what's enough to get us to heaven? Have I got to do a certain thing? Have I got to pray a certain prayer? Have I got to act a certain way? Have I got to go through some kind of program or some kind of plan? Have I, have I got to be this kind of particular individual at this particular stage in my life? No, friend, we must place our faith in Jesus Christ and the finished work at the cross in order to inherit eternal life in We're going to spend eternity in one or two places. 
Now there are people that believe, you know, I'm going to die and I'm going to come back as somebody else. Or I'm going to die and I'm going to come back as something else. Have you ever thought about that? What, what would, if you died and came back as something else, what would it be? Would you want to be an inanimate object? Or would you want to be a critter? That kind of sums them all up, doesn't it? Sometimes you ever go inside and you look at your dog or your cat and you say, man, you got it made. <laughs> yeah, amen. You lay around, the air conditioner set, thermostat set to your liking. You eat when you get ready to eat. You sleep when you get ready to sleep. And sometimes I think they just sleep because they're just sleeping. I mean, they just know, you know. And you think, you have got it made. If I were to die and come back, I would come back. And you, you ever thought of that like that? Let me tell you something. We are going to die. The Bible says we're going to die. And then the scripture says in Hebrews, there's judgment. And what's going to take place at judgment is not what did you do here and what did you do there and how did you treat this person and how did you treat that person. But what's going to be taking place there is the question is going to be asked, what have you done with Jesus? This morning I want to ask you that question as well. What have you done with Jesus? See, heaven is a reserved place. But also I want us to understand, according to verse 6, that heaven is a reverent place. Notice what happens in verse 6. And he said to me, this is God speaking to John. He, God, said to me, John, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning of and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. There have been a lot of questions asked of what are we going to do when we get to heaven. And people have it all planned out when I get to heaven the first thing I want to do is I want to meet Jesus. And after I meet Jesus I've got some family that I want to reunite with. And then after that, I want to go find my mansion in my room. I want to see where I'm going to spend eternity. Then I'm going to see how fancy it is. And I'm going to see if it's fancier than yours. And then I'm going to go down to the glassy sea. Because if you can't catch a fish in a glassy sea, you've got problems. And so people say, well, when I get to heaven, I, I, I'm just going to be glad to be there because I'm going to just slide right in and I'm barely going to get there. And when I get to heaven, I, I'm just going to be so glad to be there. I'm just going to get me a broom and I'm just going to sweep the streets the whole time I'm there. That's what, I'm, that's what my job is going to be. And, and we all put an earthly twist on the things that we like to do. Maybe you say, I, I like to talk and visit, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go find Noah and I'm going to talk about the ark. I'm going to go find Moses and I'm going to talk about the Red Sea and all the wilderness wanderings. I'm going to go find Jonah and find out about that big fish. I am convinced that when we get to heaven, we're going to spend all eternity worshiping Almighty God. You know what that looks like? What is, what is worship? Let, let's talk about that. What, what, what is worship? How, how do we worship? Now you might say, well, we get, we get up on Sunday morning and we, we already have our clothes picked out and, and on certain occasions Mama will set out certain things because we all got to look fancy on certain days and Eastern Mother's Day and things like that so we got to have a color-coordinated uh, outfit and, and then any other Sunday we get up and we get dressed and we come to church and we sit in our seats that we've always sat in. Visitors come in and say, where's a safe place to sit, preacher? They don't want to get somebody's seat. And we come to church and the music director comes up and calls out some hymns. We sing a few songs 
they pass a plate and you don't want your money to make any sound when it hits the plate. And the preacher gets up and hollers and beats on the pulpit and spits within four feet of anybody that's sitting in front of him. And if he ain't too long, we'll get out by lunch and we'll do it all over again next week and next week and next week. Is that what worship is, church? Man, I hope not. Worship is so much more than that. Worship begins in our hearts. Worship is is practically, literally a, a lifestyle of how we live our lives to bring God honor and glory. And see, God is the only one worthy of our worship and praise. Now, I I want to share with you something. I don't don't know if I've shared this with you before. The, The three most important words that we can ever tell someone is, God loves you. You know what I believe the next three are? The Bible says... Because if the Bible says it, I, 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 don't have to, I, I don't have to defend it. I don't have to argue about it. I don't have to. Let's see what the Bible says about God being the only one worthy of worship. In Philippians in chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, here's what Paul said. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. How many knees? Every knee. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. So he's covered. He said, everybody, every knee shall bow. Every knee shall bow. And that every tongue should confess. How many tongues? Every tongue. You know what that means? That means every tribe of every language. I, I, I believe at this time, every person that, 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 that even, even those that aren't able to speak, they're going to be able to speak. You say, well, preacher, I got bad knees. I can't bow. You're going to be able to bow. Maybe you're double amputee and you say, I, I, I can't. you're going to be able to bow because the Bible says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That is worship. And we bow our knees and we confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of Here's the thing about that verse. When I, when, I, when I read that verse, we need to kneel in all rather than kneeling in almost. And now let me explain that. Because at this point, when every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess, for those that have not recognized Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it will be too late. Now, when I read this, I, I believe the Bible. Amen? You believe every word of the Bible? You believe every word of the Bible? If you're asleep, I just woke you up. Every word of the Bible. And so when I read and it says every knee should bow, I I believe that I have a picture of Satan himself and the Antichrist, the Antichrist, and all of Satan's followers bowing down before God Almighty. Listen to me when I say this, it will be too late. Scripture says that they, that every name not written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. See, church, the time to kneel is now. Now is the time that we confess Jesus Christ See, then it will be too late. See, Paul wrote in Philippians in chapter 3 and verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The late Billy Graham said this, My home is in heaven. I'm just traveling through this world. You think about that for just a moment. We live in this world some 60, 70, 80, 90, even some 100 years. And we claim this world as our home. 
We have a home where our family is, where love is, is, is in the air, and, and, and we have the love of, of our family there. But listen to me. There's nothing like the love of Jesus and the love that will be in heaven for all eternity. And we will spend eternity worshiping Jesus because heaven is a reverent place. Now third and finally, real quickly, I want us to see. We've got to go back to verse 1. I saved this to the end for a reason. Heaven is a real place. Now I want us to go and I want us to see in verse 1. Now this is John. Now here's what we got to do. Let's go back and let's look at chapter 20 at verse 15. Because let, let's read it like this. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Chapter 21 verse 1 now. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also there was no more sea. Skip down to verse 3 and it says, And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them. And be their God. Heaven is a real place, amen. It's not just some place that we've created in our minds that say when we die, I want to go to a, to a, to a fancy place, to a, a good place where all the good people are going to be and we're going to sit around and we're going to do good things with good people. Heaven is a place not reserved for good people but reserved for saved people who have been born again through the precious blood of Jesus. See, God desires to spend eternity with you there. You go back in the book of Genesis and it talks about how God created everything that we see. Of all the majesties of this earth, and he did it all in six days. Jesus said over 2,000 years ago, he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to paraphrase for just a minute. He said, but if I'm going, I'm coming back to get you to take you to that place so you can be with me. He built all of this in six days. All of the splendor that this earth has to offer. We can't imagine what heaven is going to be like. The scripture says in 1 Corinthians in chapter 2, verse 9. Paul says, I have not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. Now, I encourage you to go back and read chapter 21 because it gives you a pretty vivid description of what heaven is going to be like. But that's a man-made description, or rather a man-made thought of what we think it's going to look like. But I believe when we get to heaven, it's going to be nothing that man could ever dream up of its glory and splendor. But you know all of that is going to pale in comparison to meeting Jesus face to face. See, listen to me. Jesus doesn't just want to be your friend. And He doesn't, he doesn't just want to be your Lord. Those are good things, but they're not enough. You say, well, Jesus is my friend and, and sometimes he's my Lord. That, that, that's, not what he, that's not all that he wants to be. He wants to be, listen to this, he wants to be your Savior, your Lord, and then your friend. Heaven is a real place. I pray that you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior.
if not, listen to this. Today is the day of salvation. I want to ask you this one question as we close. Do you have reservations in heaven? And if, if so, are they written in Jesus' blood? If not, today can be the day of salvation. Maybe you say, I've tried to do this and I've tried to do that. Jesus paid it all. All to him. I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. Bow with me this morning as we close in a prayer. As we think about heaven, we think about the idea of it being a reserved, reverent, real place. It's only a place for those who have accepted Jesus Christ. Those who have recognized themselves as a sinner in need of a Savior. Repenting of their sin. Agreeing with God that their sins nailed Jesus to the cross. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul later wrote that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The, the time is now to cry out to Jesus. Recognize Him as your Savior. Heavenly Father, as we come to this time in the service, I pray God that as you speak to our hearts, Lord, you would move amongst us. And Lord, if there's someone here that needs to make a decision, I pray that today would be the day. That it would be a conviction through the Holy Spirit that, that woos them to you and nothing else. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for our church. Thank you for the, the building, but most importantly, Father, the people. But greater than all these things, we are most importantly thankful for Jesus and what he did for us at the cross. And Father, it's in his precious name.